Welcome to another episode of the Jam Pack Report, today for December the 8th of 2020. Of course, this is a daily gaming news podcast, bringing you the hottest news you need to know from around the industry. Hosted on YouTube and podcast services around the world five days a week, it's your one-stop shop for everything you need to know. So if you enjoy the show and you like what you see, hit that subscribe button and keep coming back for more. But currently, we are about a month out from the launch of the next generation of consoles. Consoles. The PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series X, and the S all came out in November, and too much fan appeal. On top of that, there have also been some issues and bumps along the way, but fans are finally digging into the games they have been looking forward to. Of course, on the PlayStation 5, there are plenty of big exclusives at launch, but more to come. And on top of that, some games with their status remaining unknown. Will they come to PS4 and PS5, or just remain exclusive to the newest hardware? Thanks to a new demo reel, we now have an idea of what to expect. First and foremost, Square Enix's Project Athea is a console exclusive on PS5 for at least 24 months, and we'll talk more about Ghostwire Tokyo, Deathloop, and Gran Turismo 7 in just a moment. Project Athea, the next game from the team behind Final Fantasy XV, will be console exclusive for the PlayStation 5 for at least 24 months, a new Sony demo reel of upcoming games revealed. Little is known about Project Athea, apparently a working title apart from it being some sort of fantastical action game from Square Enix subsidiary Luminous Productions. But that has not stopped Sony from ensuring it will only be available on consoles via the PlayStation 5 for two years. The game will also be released on PC at the same time. This two-year period far surpasses the amount of time other games are set to remain console exclusive to PlayStation 5. Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo, two properties that are now technically owned by Microsoft, won't be seen on other consoles for at least a year, while Godfall is expected to be exclusive until May 2021, six months after it first launched on PlayStation 5. Other games coming first to Sony platforms include Goodbye Volcano High, Jet the Far Shore, Kenna Bridge of Spirits, Little Devil Inside, Oddworld Soulstorm, Solar Ash, and Stray, but these specific lengths of these exclusivity periods have yet to be announced. Bug Snacks, which released last month, is also a timed exclusive with no info on how long that might last. Quote, those exclusive arrangements range from a few months to a couple of years, PlayStation head of global marketing Eric Limpel explained earlier this year, providing a rough idea of how long some of these third-party games might be exclusive to PlayStation consoles. The inclusion of at least in the marketing language also indicates the possibility of extensions, which personally for me, that's an interesting new additional layer. I have never seen that before. I'm not sure if that's just something I've missed or uh, if that's kind of breaking the norm. But of course, on top of that, Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo will both be exclusive to the PlayStation 5 for one year. And additionally, Gran Turismo 7 apparently won't be cross-gen and will only launch on the PlayStation 5. Based on the latest video highlighting upcoming PS5 games, it looks like Gran Turismo 7 will only be on PS5, meaning it won't be cross-gen. Between Horizon Forbidden West, the God of War sequel, and Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, PlayStation is set up to have an incredible 2021 with amazing exclusives. One of those is Gran Turismo 7, the latest game in the famous racing series from Polyphony Digital. In a new video highlighting upcoming PS5 games, GT7 will apparently be a PS5 exclusive, meaning it won't be cross-gen. When Gran Turismo 7 showed up during the video, all it mentioned is a PlayStation 5 exclusive and it would launch in 2021. Other games shown off, such as Spider-Man Miles Morales, had a disclaimer at the bottom saying it's also available on PS4. With GT7 not having this disclaimer, it leads to thinking the game won't be cross-gen. Other upcoming first-party games, like Horizon Forbidden West, have been confirmed to launch on PS4 and PS5. And also in the trailer, we find out that Square Enix's Project Athea will be a PC and PS5 exclusive for at least two years. And of course, we've already talked about Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo and its one-year exclusivity as well. Of course, Gran Turismo 7 was first announced in June, and it's the first GT game since 2017's Gran Turismo Sport. While we don't know much about GT7, the game will supposedly release during the first half of 2021. The only trailer we've gotten is its announcement trailer, which shows off stunning footage. It also debuted GT Town, a feature that looks like a hub world kind of area. As we get closer to next year, hopefully we will get more details on the game sooner rather than later. It's yet another stellar looking PS5 exclusive that will make a packed 2021. So going back to Project Athea to begin with, this two year exclusivity period is a very long stretch of time. 
If you look at the entire lifespan of a console as roughly about eight years, this is a quarter of that life, and that is a lot of time. Uh, now, of course, we don't know many details about this game. We don't know how uh, invested the team is in making it an online kind of experience that could change the entire dynamic of this exclusivity period, because for any game to last beyond two years uh, stands to reason that it's a good game, and so if this is a good game, then the value will still be there, and there's plenty of content to catch up on, but if it is just one of those kind of flashes and it just comes and goes very quickly, Project Athea very well could be considered an exclusive on PS5 to really get that full experience. But of course, I have faith in the team at Square Enix, and so does Sony clearly, because they have a very strong partnership. PlayStation and Square Enix kind of go hand in hand, and you can see that through the Final Fantasy VII Remake release that we saw earlier this year. Now that game should be coming out on the Xbox One sometime around January of 2021, maybe February, depending on how that all goes. Uh, but ultimately, when people think about Final Fantasy, they often associate that with PlayStation. And Sony wanted to keep that going, so they paid for a one-year exclusivity period for Final Fantasy VII, and it's paid off in a big way, because now they have yet another another, and there are plenty of them, uh, AAA experience on their Game of the Year nomination roster over at the Game Awards that is completely and totally controlled by the PlayStation brand, at least for right now. And so Project Athea could be another one of those, uh, but this is one that I know a lot of people are looking forward to. Personally, I'm not a big Square Enix guy myself, but I know that's a very big deal. Now, of course, we've talked about the Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo situation a lot. This one gets pretty complicated because now technically both of these games are Microsoft-owned IP. But with that being said, it looks like they are going to be honoring this exclusivity period, so they will be one-year exclusives for the PlayStation 5. Now, finally, Gran Turismo 7 not being cross-gen. I haven't really been tuned into the community, so I don't know what the reaction to this has been. But I will tell you this. While it is nice to have plenty of games coming and spanning the two generations where you have the releases on the PS4 and the releases on the PS5, eventually you have to begin adding value to the new console. And we see that already beginning at launch. Because while Spider-Man Miles Morales is also on the PlayStation 4, uh, you do have Demon Souls being completely and totally a PlayStation 5 exclusive. You can't play that on PC. You can't play it on PS4. It certainly is not on any kind of Xbox console. Demon Souls is a PS5 game. And I think that's kind of the situation you're going to be seeing going into 2021, because while you might see Horizon Forbidden West coming out as a cross-generational game, you have to bring people into the PlayStation 5 realm very smoothly with the right games selected to be exclusives at the right time. And Gran Turismo 7... In the same way that Forza Horizon 4 highlights what the Xbox Series X is capable of, Gran Turismo 7 will highlight what the PlayStation 5 is capable of. And it's worth noting, Forza Horizon 4 isn't even made for the Xbox Series X. Gran Turismo 7 is a driving simulator that is designed around the architecture and the power of the PlayStation 5. And so to be able to really squeeze every drop out of that console, they have to make it an exclusive. That's just simply the nature of it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing this one. Now, I will say I'll be watching more of it than I will be playing of it because I'm just not a big Gran Turismo guy. Uh, I'm more into the Dirt Fives of the world where it is very arcadey. Huge fan of MotorStorm, and I would love to see one of those come back someday. While that's probably not uh, possible, it still would be nice. Uh, but Gran Turismo 7 looks like it's going to be a PS5 exclusive. Now moving on, the Call of Duty franchise has earned $3 billion over the past 12 months. Over 200 million people have also played a Call of Duty game in 2020. Following the launch of Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, Activision has revealed that the Call of Duty franchise's net bookings have surpassed $3 billion in the last 12 months alone. Net bookings, according to Activision, are an operating metric that is defined as the net amount of products and services sold digitally or sold in physically during the period, and includes license fees, merchandise, and publisher incentives, among others, and it's equal to the net revenues excluding the impact from deferrals. In 2020, Call of Duty's net bookings saw an increase of 80% year-over-year, with units sold through also increasing by 40%. 
Furthermore, Activision revealed that over 200 million people have played a game in the Call of Duty franchise in 2020, and on console and PC, Call of Duty has seen its biggest player count in recorded history for the franchise, and November 2020 was the biggest November ever in terms for monthly players and hours played. Call of Duty Warzone, which is free to play, was a big factor in these numbers and has seen a player count of over 85 million since its launch on March 10th of 2020. Black Ops Cold War has a ton of support on the way, and Season 1 is set to be released on December the 16th. This update will include the integration of Black Ops Cold War content into Warzone, and includes new maps, modes, challenges, and more. Call of Duty is on a huge winning streak, and of course Warzone, as they mention here at IGN, is a big part of that, because it is a free-to-play Battle Royale Call of Duty game. Think about those three terms. Free, Battle Royale, and Call of Duty. That is what gets people in the door if they are budget-minded gamers who just want to get home from work, sit down on the couch, and shoot at something. And a lot of people are in that boat, and they don't want to spend 60 bucks to get that experience. But, of course, Call of Duty Warzone is popular on Twitch. It's one of the biggest battle royales out right now. Uh, and it kind of did take the world by storm, because Call of Duty remains a powerhouse. It just has that stopping power. Now, you see what I did there with the with the perk? Um, but it has that stopping power that really does just bring people in and really uh, ranks up a lot of cash. And so with $3 billion in the last 12 months, that is incredibly impressive. Uh, now my question is, how much of that is also coming from Call of Duty Mobile, which is one that many people overlook, uh, because while Black Ops Cold War and Warzone might have the spotlight, mobile is taking a lot of, of the mind share of those that play on mobile devices. It's a very good game. And so all in all, Call of Duty is kind of really killing it on all fronts uh, with, again, an 80% year-over-year increase in net bookings. That is incredibly uh, impressive, and for good reason. The Black Ops and Modern Warfare franchises have really brought a lot of love back to Call of Duty uh, that was lacking in that weird advanced warfare, infinite warfare kind of phase. Uh, and so I really think that they are going in the right direction. And for me, Black Ops Cold War is pretty good fun. I'm enjoying it a good bit. Uh, now, I don't play nearly as much Call of Duty as I did back in the day. I'm more of the Assassin's Creed Valhalla Tetris Effect connected kind of guy right now, uh, but ultimately Call of Duty still has a strong place in my heart, and it's pretty much my go-to mindless grind fest, you know, where I just play multiplayer, shoot at things, don't think that's my favorite game for that. But The Wolf Among Us 2 could be getting a spotlight at the Game Awards and a release date for winter of 2021. Rumors are circulating that The Wolf Among Us 2 will be one of the games to appear at the Game Awards on December the 10th. According to an anonymous Reddit user, the game will show a teaser trailer and a developer update video. These will confirm a winter 2021 release window for PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X, and PC. The game has a good relationship with the Game Awards, as it was during the 2019 show when the game was announced. Aside from the news that development was started from scratch when Telltale Games reopened, little else is known about the game. That look set the change at this year's awards. There will be five episodes, and the events of the story begin five years after the end of The Wolf Among Us. Most of the game will take place in New York City. Returning character Bigsby will also... Bigby? Is it Bigsby or Bigby? Bigby? Let's go with Bigby. It's a fun little word to say. Uh, we'll also travel to a small town in Vermont where he'll investigate a missing fable. As well as Bigby, Snow White will be a playable character in some of the game's sections. These two characters and more will be voiced by a cast that includes Adam Harrington, Aaron Yvette, Gavin Hammond, Melissa Hutchinson, Nick Apostolides, Troy Baker, Dave Fenoy, Ashley Birch, Cree Summers, and Patrick Warburton. The main award show won't be the only place where the gaming news will flow. Host Jeff Keighley has confirmed that the pre-award show will have five world premieres. At some point, we'll see Hayes Light Games' Joseph Ferris show a gameplay premiere for It Takes Two, and we already know we'll be seeing Season 3 of Fall Guys. It looks like Fortnite will be there too. Another tease from Keighley showed a mystery backpack belonging to Agent Jones. The character's voice actor Troy Baker is already confirmed to be a host at the awards. Agent Jones belongs to a secret organization that has previously controlled Athena. They currently control Apollo, which he has planned for the future, will likely be revealed in just a few days' time. So, The Wolf Among Us 2. This is a big Telltale game that people have been looking forward to. They kind of got stuck in that weird transitional period slash development hell whenever Telltale games fell apart. A uh, little personal anecdote, I remember that I was interning at a news station in college uh, when the news broke that Telltale Games had basically just been obliterated. Uh, that's kind of the way that it went. 
And so after the team began to recover and everybody kind of picked up the pieces, the Telltale brand was revitalized. Now, it's not really the same team. Some of the same people are working on it, but it's a different company with better management is essentially what I'm trying to say. Uh, and so I think this is actually going to be a fresh start for the company. Uh, but I never did play The Wolf Among Us. I know it's kind of a crime for some people, but it is nice to see that a game many, many people loved is getting a sequel. And hopefully we will see more in just a couple of days. Now moving on, Take-Two CEO says the games are 10 years away from photorealism. Take-Two CEO Strauss Zelnick believes the future of games looks very good, photorealistic even. Speaking at the UBS Global TNT virtual conference today, Zelnick shared his optimism around the games industry's future, saying a growing audience, advances in technology, and other factors will help make the next 30 to 40 years the most exciting yet for games. I'm guessing Take-Two's business in 10 years looks very different than it does today, in the same way that it looks very different today than it did 10 years ago, when there was no mobile business and no recurrent consumer spending, Zelnick said. And I can't quite say what that will involve, but I think what you're going to see is technology will allow our creative folks to do things they have never been able to do before, including make games that look exactly like live action. Some of what we do now looks a lot like live action, but it's still animation. In 10 years, you'll have the option if you want to make things that look completely realistic, all done inside a computer, never mind all the other advances technology will enable. Add that to the gaming mixes of traditional narratives akin to other media with gameplay and increasing social integrations and features, and Zelnick believes the future for games as a whole is exceedingly bright. All of those things lead me to believe there will be massive moves in our business, many of which we can't entirely predict, massive growth in the business, and there will be a lot of dynamic opportunity, both in terms of what we can do creatively and what we can do on the business side to exploit that creativity, Zelnick said. Ten years is a long period of time, and while it is easy to look back at games from 2010 and say, well, there are advancements, but they aren't that incredible, I like to look back at the technology leap between 1999 and 2009. Think about that. I mean, you're looking at games from 1999 and comparing them to games. The first one that comes out of my mind is Modern Warfare 2, but 2009 had plenty of great games. Uh, but if you think about these elements and you think about how far gaming had come from 1999 to 09, that's the kind of leap that you could see from 2020 to 2030. Now, of course, you are getting to a point where 4K60 is making things look phenomenal. Uh, and I don't know necessarily that the future growth is going to be found in resolution and in frame rate because we already are getting uh, to these achievements where things look very, very good. The question is, how can we create character models and how can we create facial animations and how can we use the screens and the technology that we have today in our homes and in our gaming setups while the developers on the back end are able to leverage the power of emerging technology and new methodologies to game development to create things that just simply look better and look more realistic. Uh, I mean, even if you watch uh, a movie like, this is a horrible example, uh, actually, I'm not even going, yeah, well, sure, let's use it, why not? Uh, the original Toy Story, while it, of course, looked good, comparing that to what Toy Story 3 was able to accomplish, uh, there are just better textures, there are higher resolution images, the character models look more natural. There are so many advancements, even in the world of animation, that if you take those lessons that are learned there and you apply them to creating these realistic looking uh, models and you create these realistic looking people, you can really have some very in-depth experiences there. But Take-Two CEO says games are 10 years from photorealism. 10 years seems like a pretty good amount of time, but it could be even sooner than that. Now, for those that want to actually see a real person play the game they're watching, then you might want to go to Twitch or YouTube, and if you do want to go to YouTube, you could be seeing some Google Stadia users streaming today, all three of them. From the very beginning, Google Stadia and YouTube were supposed to work together thanks to the magic of cloud computing. You'd be able to click a YouTube ad to instantly begin playing the game. YouTubers would be able to invite their viewers to instantly join their game, and perhaps most importantly, creators would be able to instantly, effortlessly be able to stream their Stadia games to YouTube just by pressing a button on the controller. None of these things ever happened at Stadia's launch last November, but the biggest one is apparently arriving tomorrow. Every Stadia user will be able to live stream directly to YouTube starting tomorrow, a rep confirmed to The Verge. This afternoon, 9to5 noticed that 
Or I should say 9 to 5 Google noticed that the feature appeared to be rolling out, and we spotted the ability to link a YouTube account and our Stadia accounts as well, though not the ability to actually stream yet. I guess we'll try that tomorrow, they say. According to 9to5Google, you will still have to give your stream a title and tweak a few settings, like whether your stream is appropriate for kids to comply with children's protection rules, and it's also not clear whether you'll be able to stream in 4K quite yet, as Stadia originally promised. You'll also likely need a 9.99 a month subscription pro for that, uh, but you uh, also need that for 4K gameplay as well. The feature could not come at a more important time for Stadia. The service's most important game yet, Cyberpunk 2077, is arriving this week at a time when next-gen consoles and the latest graphics cards to build your own powerful PC are incredibly difficult and expensive to buy. It is the biggest test yet for Stadia and one the company is banking on. Buying Cyberpunk on the service comes with a full set of free Stadia hardware for a limited time, not unlike the set it gave free to YouTube Premium subscribers. People streaming Cyberpunk 2077 from Stadia to YouTube could be the single biggest opportunity yet for Google to prove what its service can do. I think that Google needs to be able to prove the value of Stadia itself to get people on board before those people can begin proving the value of Stadia to those that might just be looking for content. And I mean that in the most heartwarming way possible. I have a coworker that stands by Stadia and says that it's fun, but ultimately the most people, the majority of gamers, are going to want that console experience, that PC experience. I don't know that people are ready for what Google Stadia brings fully. And on top of that, the branding itself is beginning to kind of wear on people because Google Stadia in your mind is already seen as that flailing streaming service from Google. It's not seen as this innovative uh, innovation. Uh, that's a horrible back-to-back -back use of the word innovation. Uh, but it's not seen as that mind-blowing, ground-shaking industry shattering experience that Google really wanted. And so in the same way, Project X Cloud over at Microsoft isn't really seen as the experience they want you to have yet. Uh, there has been talk about the Xbox streaming stick, but X Cloud has kind of built itself up as this accessory to what you have with Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. Google Stadia is its own platform. And unfortunately, the majority of the conversation around it has been relatively negative. Uh, so, if you want to dive in and play, Cyberpunk 2077, of course, gets you basically everything you would need to get into the world of the uh, Google Stadia streaming universe. But if you don't want that, the game is also coming out on Xbox, PS4, and PC. Now, to round out today's show, Valve is rolling out PS5 controller support to all Steam users. And we're talking about the full nine yards. All Steam gamers can now play titles with the platform's input API with PS5's DualSense controller. Valve has been adding support for DualSense little by little ever since Sony's new console launched in mid-November. It started by adding initial compatibility on PS5's launch day and then rolling out full support for the controller's LED, trackpad, rumble, and gyro features a couple of weeks ago. However, players had to opt in to Steam's public beta client to use it. Now, the compatibility has also made its way to non-beta Steam through the latest client update. Games that can't support DualSense's LED, trackpad, rumble, and gyro features on Steam include Death Stranding, No Man's Sky, and Horizon Zero Dawn, though the controller works with many, many more titles. In addition to rolling out DualSense compatibility for everyone, Valve has also fixed an issue with the Xbox Series X controller, which shows up as two separate controllers when linked. Plus, it has added a directional swipe mode for use with trackpads and gyro. The developer has fixed other issues with the client as well, including a problem with videos from YouTube's website not starting automatically, and an error with the Windows and Mac OS voice hotkeys. So, if you do want to dive in with your PS5 on the Steam platform, you can absolutely do that now with the full and unhinged power of the dual sense but that rounds out today's episode of the jam pack report if you enjoyed today's show drop me a like down below and let me know what stories caught your eye of course i will be back but that rounds out today's episode of the jam pack report if you enjoyed today's show drop me a like down below and let me know what you think about everything we talked about here today but specifically what do you think about these ps5 console exclusives i would love to hear your thoughts on these periods on if you are going to be picking them up and on what platform you will be playing them on but until tomorrow you guys have a fantastic rest of your day i'll talk to you soon and peace